Hello everyone and welcome to the first lecture for optimization for AMS 2940. In this course we are going to be looking at optimization with a focus on linear programming. So we're going to start by talking about what is a mathematical program and what is a linear program. But this is a very applied area. So we're going to be spending a lot of time looking at real world examples or places where you can use this. So real world optimization. What are the kinds of things that we're looking at solving? And here are some actual problems that I've worked on in the past that where these tech, the linear programming technique or related techniques have been used to solve some problems and optimize, optimize things. How can a school board pick up all the students and deliver them to school on time for the lowest cost? This is a classic program called the Traveling Salesman Program, uh, or a variant of it, anyways. And it's actually a very difficult problem to do as soon as you get a large number of students. How can a police force schedule members on a deployment to meet all requirements and minimize the number of members needed? So this was an actual example from the Vancouver Olympics in 2010 that I worked on, looking at the RCMP had to send a lot of people to Vancouver for security. It cost a lot of money to send all the people to send or to send each person. So they wanted to minimize the number of people they had to send. But people can only work so long. After a shift, they have to take so much time off. There's a, they can only work so many uh, so many days in in a month. There were a lot of things that were holding them back. So the question was, how could you schedule people to work? and minimize the cost of sending all those people. How much effort does a mining company need to exert to ensure workers are safe when excavating in a former war zone? This was a problem where there were mines left over in Vietnam from, uh, or in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Vietnam and area from the Vietnamese war. And the mining company had to figure out what is the risk of of finding unexploded mines and minimize that risk. To minimize that risk, they had to clear the mines, a very expensive thing to do. So the question was, how far did you have to go to make sure that you had all the mines cleared? How many new recruits does the Air Force need to ensure they will have the proper number of members in 20 years? So when people join the Air Force, they tend to stay for a certain length of time. Some people stay for short times, some people stay for long times but the Air Force wants people with certain skills. They want a certain number of people who can speak French. They want a number of, certain number of pilots. They want a certain number of um, engineers and maintenance people, and they need to have that number fairly consistent over the years. If you recruit too many people now to solve a short-term need, you're gonna end up paying a lot of people for jobs that, they, they don't, that aren't needed five or 10 years down the road. So how can you schedule your recruitment to make sure that you're gonna be okay 10 or 20 years down the road? How can firefighters maximize the amount of water given different truck capacities, water flow rates, and available personnel? When there's a fire, you want to maximize the amount of water you can put on, on the fire. But different trucks can pump different ways. Uh, water has to be moved by truck sometimes so how can you schedule this should a truck be pumping or should it be moving water these are questions that ha that have to be addressed whenever there's a fire for firefighters how can an animal feed company produce products that meet nutritional requirements for the lowest price so you can mix different uh, types of basic feeds to give the cow uh, cows or horses or whatever the what well, uh, whatever the animal is, they need a certain amount of protein. They need a certain amount of fat. They need a certain amount of different nutrients, of different vitamins. Well, how can you combine different products that have different mixtures to give the, the animal what it needs, but keep the cost down as low as possible because these base products all have different prices. These are just some real world examples of optimization where some of these techniques that we're gonna learn in this course have been applied successfully to maximize the use of your resources.
optimization as a whole is really asking what is the best way to allocate limited resources. Whenever there's a decision that has to be made, it has to be taken into account. Well, if I had all the resources I ever need, I could make a perfect decision, but that's usually not the case. You're usually limited by the resources that you have. And you also normally have to optimize for something. You want to do it in the, in the shortest time, or you want to do it for the lowest cost, or you want to do it with a minimal disruption. So there are things that you have to try and uh, try and meet, but you don't have unlimited resources. So the question is, how can you place your resources or how can you use your resources to make the best decisions? And those decisions are sometimes worth a lot of time or a lot of money. There's many mathematical techniques to this. This course is going to focus on something called linear programming. So this is an introduction to the wide world of optimization, which is a huge mathematical area. When you're talking about optimization, you're often your biggest challenge isn't solving the mathematics behind it, although that can be a problem sometimes, but an even bigger challenge a lot of the time is formulating the problem. Because we have a messy real world problem with all kinds of variables, all kinds of unknowns, we have to turn that into mathematical equations. That is just as important as knowing the mathematics behind it. So we're going to spend a significant amount of time in this course looking at formulating problems. How can we turn a problem into a set of mathematical equations? And then we can solve the mathematical equations. Okay, so I've thrown out ma the term linear programming. This is part of a wider thing called mathematical programming. A mathematical programming is made up of a few different elements. You have to make a decision and you have to optimize something. So first off, you have an op objective function, something that you want to make as big or as small as possible, or as close to something as possible, but some way of measuring your success. You have things that you can change. Those are your variables, decision variables. So you want to make something as good as possible and you have control over these things, but you don't have unlimited control over your variables. You have constraints. You have things that hold you back. So there's really three things in here. There is what you want to optimize. There are the things you can change. And there are the things that hold you back. Objective function, decision variables, and constraints. So in mathematical terms, we can write a very general way of doing it. That you want to maximize your objective function over your decision variables subject to constraints. And we're going to be seeing this in a more uh, in a more rigorous way in a little while. That's a general mathematical problem, a mathematical program. We are going to be dealing for the most part in this course with linear programs. What is a linear program? A linear program is a mathematical program where your objective function and your constraints can all be expressed in terms of linear functions of decision variables. For example, here is your objective function. You have a function 3x1 plus 5x2, two variables. So your variables are x1 and x2. Those are the things you're allowed to change. You have an objective function, in this case, 3x1 plus 5x2, that you want to make as large as possible. You want to maximize it. Well, if x1 and x2 could be anything in the world, you could make it as big as we want it to. Well, that could grow off infinitely large. That's where your constraints come in. Here are your constraints. These are the things that hold you back. And again, in a linear program, everything is linear. None of your variables are ever squared. They're never 
to square roots. They're never exponentially growth. They're, they are just linear. All of your variables are a number times your variable plus a number times your variable equals something. Usually when you see your constraints, not always, but usually, they're going to be in terms of inequalities. So here we have inequalities. Things are less than or equal to something. That's your constraint. That's what's holding you back. So your first constraint, 4x1 plus 2x2, is less than or equal to 60. That's a constraint. That means that your numbers x1 and x2, when combined in that way, can only be as big as 60. That's something that's holding you back. And we have a total of five constraints in here, three equations, and two non-negative non-negativity constraints. That is a linear program. The key is all of the equations are linear, and this is what we're going to be working with through most of this course. So here's an example. Here is a linear program. We're going to solve this first by a graphical approach. And this graphical approach is going to give us a bit of an idea of the main technique that we're using in this course, which is going to be called the simplex algorithm. When you use the simplex algorithm with two variables, of course, with two variables, you can graph them out. You can get a, an idea of how the simplex algorithm works. So we're going to start by solving this, looking at it graphically. And then I'll talk about how the simplex algorithm, which we're going to see in the next class, in the next lecture, we're going to see, we're going to get a bit of an idea for what it's doing. So if we want to graph this out, we, we're, the first step is graph the feasible region. What do we mean by a feasible region? A feasible region is, is the set of all the points for x1 and x2, all of their possible values. Remember, we have constraints, so because of those constraints, x1 and x2 can't grow forever. There are limitations to them. So we're going to graph x1 and x2 and see what is possible. So here's my constraints, just written up here in the corner. Let's put a, a coordinate system here. So this is x1 and this is x2. And I am going to put on here a couple of points, um, just for making it a little bit easier for graphing. I'm going to say that that's 10 and that's 10. So 10x1 and 10x2. And let's graph this out. What do we get? Well, let's take the first line. So our first line is for our first constraint. 4x1 plus 2x2 is less than or equal to 32. Change that inequality to inequality. So make it into 4x1 plus 2x2 equals 32. Now we have a line. We can graph that line. So there's lots of ways of graphing it, but in a simple one like this, we can just take a sim something simple by saying, well, let x1 equal 0. What do we get if x1 equals 0? Then we have 2x2 equals 32, so x2 would equal 16, so way up there. If we go the other way, if we let x2 equals 0, then x1 equals 32 over 4, so that's 8. So that line goes through 8, 0, and it goes through 0, 16. So it is going to look like something like that. Okay. That's my line 4x1 plus 2x2 equals 32. Now, that's just the line. Remember, my constraint is it's less than or equal to 32. So what does that mean? That means that I am limited to only looking at one side of this line. So which side of the line? Well. To see that, all we have to do is take a point on one side of the line and see if it satisfies the constraint. So I want to see, so the easiest point here is to take 0, 0 and say, okay, the point x1 equals 0, x2 equals 0, 
does that satisfy my inequality? If I plug 0, 0 into there, you can see that, yes, it does. You get that 0 is less than or equal to 32. So that means that I am looking at everything on this side of the line. Everything on that side satisfies my constraint. Everything on the other side violates my constraint. So I'm only allowed to look at points on that side of the line. Now let's repeat this exercise for the next two. My next one is 4x1 plus 4x2 is less than or equal to 40. If I let x1 equal 0, I get that x2 equals 10. So it goes through 10, 0, 10. Same thing if I let x2 equal 0, then x1 equals 10. So it goes through 0, 10. And that's my line. Now I have to question which side of the line is it? Again, easiest thing to do is look at point zero, zero. If I set it equal to zero, zero, it satisfies that constraint. So again, I am looking at that side of the green line. And all the points on that side satisfy it. So I'm starting to limit my area. Third one. 2x1 plus 4x2 is less than or equal to 30. What happens here? Well, if I let x1 equals 0, I get x2 equals 7.5. So it's about there. If I let x2 equals 0, x1 is 15. So it's way off the chart here. I get something that looks like this. And again, by comparing it, I get that or by testing a point, I get that I'm only looking at points under that line like that. Now I have two more constraints and these are very common constraints, not always, but they're very common in, in, um, in linear programs. They're non-negativity constraints. It says that my X one has to be greater than zero. My X two has to be greater than or equal to zero. So that means I'm only looking at things that are on that side of my axes. So overall, what does this mean? This means that the points that I'm interested in are in this area, inside all of those lines. So that is the first step of figuring out the graphical solution to a linear program. You have to figure out the area of the plane, in this case of the plane, where you're, you have what are called feasible points. In other words, your constraints are saying you can only look in that area. You can't look anywhere else, because if you look someplace else, you are going to violate one of these constraints and that you're not allowed to do. You are not never allowed to violate a constraint when you're solving a straight linear program. So here's the same thing drawn a little bit nicer. A little bit nicer. So here is my feasible region. The feasible region, again, these are the only places that I'm allowed to look. But I still, now I, the, this, this gives me all of my possible values for the variables. But there is still a problem here in that if you look at in there, we're not only limited to integer values, we have infinitely many points in there. And we're saying it could be any of these points inside this region. So how do you figure out which of those infinitely many points is the best value for our objective function. And here is where linearity comes into play again. Remember our objective function was C equals 3x1 plus 5x2. Our whole objective here is to make this as large as possible, but we aren't allowed to leave that feasible region. So 
I am going to take this, this equation, I'm going to give it some values, and I'm going to start to overlay it. So I'm going to say, well, what if I can only make it equal to zero? Where would that be on my graph? Then I'm going to say, well, maybe I can do better than zero. Maybe I can make it equal to five. Where would that be on my graph? Maybe I can make it equal to 10. Where would that be? And I'm going to keep on increasing this until I get to a number that is where I just can't do it, whether it's impossible to do it in my feasible region. So let's start with the first one. What if I say, well, I think that I can only make this as large as zero. What does that mean? Well, I've already graphed out the feasible region from before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my objective function equal to zero and graph it as well. So when I make this equal to zero, I get this line, the orange line. And you can see this only meets my, uh, my feasible region at a single point. So it is possible that there is a point, or we know that there is a point where my objective function is equal to zero that is in my feasible region. That could be my answer. But can I do better? So I'm going to say now, well, what if I let my objective function equal five? Can I do it? Can I do better than zero? By drawing that orange line again, you can see, yes, I can do better. In fact, now there is infinitely many points where that objective function is equal to five. So I'm doing better. Okay, well, let's try something bigger. Can I make it even bigger than five? Can I make it equal to 10? Sure I can. I draw the, draw the line and you can see that there's, again, infinitely many points equal to 10. But now note what this line is doing. As I make it equal to bigger and bigger numbers, I am moving the orange line in a certain direction. If I were to make it equal to 20, it would be up someplace around here, and so on. I am making it bigger and bigger and bigger. What I'm doing is I am moving my objective line until I am almost out of my feasible region. So you can see at this point, I've moved my line up so far that if I move it any farther, I leave my objective re region or my feasible region. So by looking at this, I can now say, well, I no longer have an infinitely many, infinitely many points that satisfy this line. I've moved it as far as I can, but it is only meeting my feasible region at one point. That's got to be my answer. If I move, whenever I draw that line equal to something, my line moves up or down. This is as, this is as high as I can move it, as big a number as I can get, and still be in that feasible region. Now the question is, what is that? What is that value? Well, if we take a look at what that point is, what's that point? That's the intersection of the of your line 2x plus 2x1 plus 4x2 equals 30. And my second constraint line, 4x1 plus 4x2 equals 40. I am looking at the intersection of two of my constraints. And that's actually a very important thing to note. So if I want to find out what that point is, I'm looking at the intersection of two lines. I can take this and I can use some of my techniques for solving systems of linear equations to solve this. In this case, I can just subtract one line from the other or one equation from the other. 
I get negative 2x1 equals negative 10. So x1 equals 5. Plug that back in. Uh, let's say you plug it into the first equation. I get 10 plus 4x2 equals 30. So 4x2 equals 20 and x2 equals 5. So that tells me that my point is x1, x2 is equal to 5, 5. That is my point right there. And that is the best that I can do. So that is my optimal point. In the entire feasible region, this is the one single point that will give me the best solution. So what's the value of my objective function? Well, my objective function was 3x1 plus 5x2. And I've said that this is as big as I can possibly get it when x1 equals 5 and x2 equals 5. So c equals 3 times 5 plus 5 times 5. So that's 15 plus 25. That equals 40. There is your answer. That equation, that objective function, my task was to make it as big as possible. But I still had to stay in my, my, my feasible region. Well, I saw that if I draw out my feasible region, I draw my objective function, those parallel lines that represent my objective function's different values, I can see my objective function can only move in one direction as it gets bigger. By moving it as far as possible, there is a point of intersection where that line is as big or that value is as big as possible. I can figure out what that intersection is. Once I have that point, I can figure out what the value of my objective function is. My objective function can never get any bigger than 40 and it's equal to 40 exactly at that point. Work through if, if this kind of puzzles you a little bit, make up a few examples of two constraints with a simple thing, just pick some random numbers and draw it out and you can see how this works. But this is one of the key ideas behind simplex programming and linear, uh, sorry, the simplex method and linear programming. It gives us something called the corner point theorem. The maximum or the minimum of a linear program, if it exists, will necessarily occur at a vertex or a corner point of the constraint set. The constraint set, we're talking about the feasible region. So the feasible region, we saw that it was made up of straight lines. So it's a whole bunch of straight lines. They have intersections. What this is saying that our feasible region, when we just drew it out, was an infinite number of points. It was this blob of straight lines. This says we don't have to worry about all those things in the middle. We only have to worry about the corner points, the corners of that region. This is an extremely critical uh, observation about solving linear programs. Because what it does is it means that you don't have an infinite number of possible solutions you have a finite number of solutions, possible places where the solution can occur. So all of a sudden you don't have to look at every point in that region, you only have to look at the corners. Later on in the course, we're going to see an actual proof of this, but the geometrical approach to it should give you an intuitive idea of why this works. It's more complex when you get into multi-dimensions and when you have 75 variables instead of two variables, but when you're dealing with two variables and you can draw it out as a graph, it gives you an intuitive idea of what's happening and why this corner point theorem works. So the overall solution technique here is find all the points of intersections of constraints and see which has the minimum or the maximum value of the objective function, whatever you're trying to find. Sometimes a linear program will ask you to find the maximum. Sometimes it will ask you to find the minimum. Whatever it's trying to find, you only have to look at the corner points instead of an infinite number of points.
Here's an example, another example. We have these, this objective function subject to these constraints. Something to solve out. When you solve it out, you get something that looks like this for a feasible region. Okay. And now, it's a good exercise for you to ignore this, go back to the linear program, and try to solve it out yourself. Okay. So, but you have this for a feasible region. You can see in this case, you have a feasible region which is infinite. In the last one, we had a boundary for it all. It was a nice compact region. This is an infinite region. When you have an infinite region, it is possible you have no solution. So that's one thing to keep in mind. In this case, we are looking at corners again. So we have three corners, three zero, zero four, and whatever that point is. So we have three corners to look at, but because it's an infinite region, we also have the possibility that if I, that as my line goes out that way, it will grow smaller and smaller. Because in this case, we were asked to find a minimum. It will grow smaller and smaller. But what happens? We were asked to minimize that so look at all the points, all the corner points. Our corner point three zero, we had that for a value. Our corner point three and a half one, that was the one in the middle. We have a value of a dollar thirty. At our corner point of zero four, we had a dollar sixty. So the those were the only corners that were in our feasible region. The minimum occurs at a dollar thirty. But now, because we had an infinite region, we have to ask, well, is this actually a minimum? Or if I pick some other point in that infinite region, is it going to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller? Well, you can see from your equation, minimize C equals 0.6x1 plus 0.4x2. If we let x, the x's get larger and larger, our objective function is going to get larger and larger. So that means that as we move out into that infinite area, my objective function is just going to get larger, but I'm trying to make it small. So in this case, that does give me the minimum. If I were to adjust that and say that here is my maximum, then or instead of minimizing it, I'm trying to maximize it, what happens? Well, if you recall, my feasible region looked a little bit like this. And my feasible region was this area up here. I figured out what happened at my corner points. But now, if I pick some point that's way up here, say x1 equal 500, x2 equal 500, and you can make those as large as possible, what happens? Well, that just gets larger and larger. This has no solution. So it is possible that a linear program has no solution. It may be that your constraints aren't enough to hold you back, that there is no matter what solution you pick, there is always a better solution. Real world, that doesn't happen very often, but in the mathematical world, yes, it can happen that you will run into problems where there is no solution. And we're going to see technique that tells you when there is no solution. But this should give you an idea graphically of what happens. Now, one other thing that I want to point out here, when we saw this area graphed out, we had, I, I quickly drew the, the graph here. We had a line here, this line, which doesn't seem to do anything. It, it never touches the feasible region. That happens all the time. You can end up with constraints that once you graph everything out, don't actually do anything. You could drop that constraint out entirely and you're going to have the exact same problem. Okay. 
So that's not unusual dealing with a linear program. In fact, there's the feasible region of it again, drawn out nicer. And here is the line I was talking about. That constraint never does anything. It's totally outside the feasible region. That's not unusual. Now, here's an adjusted problem again. This is going back and looking at um, a very, something very close to our original problem. And I'm not going to work this out in detail here, but uh, this is something that we are going to look at called sensitivity. It's basically saying, what happens if I solve my problem and then I change something? So in this case, I'm saying, if you look up here, my in my constraint or in my objective function, I'm saying, well, what happens if I change my objective function? What happens if instead of, well, it used to be 3x1, what happens if instead of 3x1, I have 2.5x1, or I have 7x1? What if something changes? And that happens all the time in the real world. All of a sudden, there is a, a, a wage increase. So it costs you more to make something. That means your objective function is changing. The question is, when, when I change something, when do I have to then change my problem? So again, this is, this is drawing out the first thing that we solved, okay, where we saw that the objective function had the solution right there. We had 3x1 plus 5x2 equals whatever it was, um, if I recall correctly, it was equal to 40 at that point. Now I'm saying, well, what if this three changes? What if all of a sudden it becomes a two? Or what if it becomes a four? What happens? Well, in that case, what you're doing is you're changing the slope of your line. So when that happens, your objective function this line that represents your objective function changes its slope. It could be suddenly start looking, I'm not going to erase that. It could suddenly start looking like this. Or it could look like this. What you're doing is you're changing your slope. So what makes it, when that A changes, when, or when that was three, your solution was there. But we've already said that the solutions always happen on the corners. So where can this happen? It could happen here. What would make it change? Well, if the slope of that line suddenly changes to look like to look like this, where it's increasing in that direction, you can see now suddenly you can slide it farther over. So when the slope of your of your objective line, or of your, yeah, uh, when the slope of the line representing your objective function changes, at some point it's gonna change so much that you have to jump to a different corner. So you can see when it changes to that, I could slide it over and all of a sudden that would become my optimal point. When does it make that change? When it's parallel to your constraint. When it's parallel to the constraint, that point still works. If you go a little bit farther, you have to go to a different point. So think this through. This is another important concept that we're gonna do and it's something called sensitivity. It's saying, okay, I'm changing something. Does this change my solution? Does it change my solution a little bit or does it change it a lot? So try to get an idea of what is happening here geometrically when we have two, two variables.
And I would suggest that you take this, resolve this problem by, by trying different uh, constraints or different objective functions. Try an objective function of 2x1 plus 5x2 equals c. Then try uh, 7x1 plus 5x2 equals c. And try all kinds of different values for there. Just so you can try to get a bit of an intuitive idea of what happens when we start changing some of the numbers. Again, we are going to be seeing this mathematically approaches to solve this and how and what it what it really means, but that'll be coming a little bit later in the course. But it really helps you to get an idea geometrically on two dimensions of what is happening. Okay, so we said that a geometric, a or that a feasible region is made up by drawing these straight lines and picking one side, one side or the other. Well, can this be a feasible region? And the answer is no. Because if you can imagine the lines that would go into this, you would have a line that's running here where you're picking everything on that side of it. That's no problem. You would have a line here where you're picking everything on that side of it. No problem. But now what about the other sides? For this, I would have to have a line like that where I'm picking everything on this side of the line. Oops. I've got a feasible area here or something that I said I think is a feasible region, a feasible area. That's on the wrong side of my line. So if you're familiar with the idea of convex and concave regions or boundaries of regions, this is concave. Okay, so any feasible region has to be convex. In other words, if I pick any two points in my feasible region, I, ha I can draw a straight line between them without leaving. That, can't ha that doesn't happen here. This is not a feasible region. When it comes to the simplex method for linear programming, that's where you're only checking corners, it's not as important a property. It is a property, but it's not as important. There are other techniques that hopefully we'll get into by the end of the course, thing called interior methods, method solutions, where this becomes a very important property in finding a solution. But the key takeaway from this slide is that feasible regions have to be convex. You can't have a feasible region that looks like this. All right, so thanks for your attention on this. Next lecture, we are going to be looking at uh, the simplex method and looking at online methods for solving it.